Let's remain standing, and this evening I want to uh, uh, look at uh, Passover and what the Bible uh, teaches about it. Actually, <clears throat> there's a lot of Bible teaching about the Passover uh, and uh, how, what they are to eat and before they would leave and so forth, uh, uh, the land of Egypt. But turn to Exodus chapter 12, and let's read together the first 14 verses, uh, Exodus 12, Verses 1 through 14. Together now. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Amen. Now, uh, keep your finger there. We'll come back to that. And uh, turn in your uh, New, Tes <coughs> New Testament to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we want to read verse 7. Let's read uh, together. Purge out, therefore... So we learned that uh, the Old Testament Passover is a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one more scripture, turn back to the Gospels in Luke chapter 22 and verse 15. And uh, let's read it together. Luke 22 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Amen. You may be seated. Now, uh, this evening, what we want to look at is the, uh, the Bible teaching about the Passover, because obviously the Passover is a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The illustration, the Bible says very clearly in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed uh, for uh, us. And then we uh, learn that the Lord Jesus Christ... Uh, uh, instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, uh, and they observed the Passover, uh, and then instituted the Lord's Supper according to the Word of God. Now, 
Uh, this evening what we want to look at is just the fact of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Now, Lord willing, next uh, Wednesday night, Lord willing, Lord Terry, so forth, uh, then we want to uh, read there about the eating of the lamb. See, they're not only to sacrifice the lamb, but they were to eat the lamb also. And then they were to prepare for the journey. So actually you have three aspects of uh, the teaching about the Passover in the Word of God. You have the slaying of the lamb, you have the eating of the lamb, and then you have the preparing for the journey to leave uh, uh, Egypt. Now, as you turn to uh, Exodus chapter 10 and verse 16, what we learn here is why they um, were, uh, why God brought the judgment of the uh, uh, smiting of the firstborn upon the nation of uh, 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 the Egyptians here. And in chapter 10, and as you read over there, uh, in uh, verse uh, 16, the Bible says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. So we learn here in the Word of God that, you see, Pharaoh sinned, the Bible says here, uh, very clearly in Exodus 10 and verse 16. They sinned against the Lord and uh, against uh, the people of of uh, Israel at that particular time. And then look at chapter 11 and verse uh, 1. Chapter 11 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh. So this is the last of the ten, ten plagues upon the Egyptians. And, then, and the Bible says here in Exodus 11 and verse 1, and the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go. Hence, when he shall let you go, uh, he shall surely thrust you out thence uh, altogether. So now uh, what we're studying about in the context of the Passover is that this is the last of the ten plagues upon the nation of uh, Egypt. Uh, Passover was the last of the ten plagues. Now, we just want to list those ten uh, plagues in the Word of God. Now, number one, the water was turned into blood. Literally, in uh, Exodus 7 and verses 14 through 25. And then number two, the Bible says the frogs covered the land. That was the second uh, plague in uh, Exodus 8 and verses 1 through uh, 15. By the way, they uh, uh, had on the news recently, in fact today, that I believe it's in Australia, is it in Australia, where the mice have overrun uh, a certain area of Australia. And uh, the mice are in the homes, in their bedrooms, their bathrooms, in the stores, uh, in the streets, and it's a very unusual thing that we read about there. And in the news, they brought out that it is a plague of biblical proportions, where somehow these uh, mice are running all over the countryside and all the homes and all the, uh, the stores over there. I believe it's in Australia. Well, the second plague was the frogs covered the land in uh, chapter 8 and verses 1 through 15. And then uh, uh, the third plague was the plague of the lice, and we read about that in Exodus 8 and verses 16 through 19. And then the fourth plague was the plague of the flies, and that's Exodus 8, 20 through 32. And number five was the disease on the beast, and that was chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And then... Uh, uh, Number six was the boils, the, uh, those boils on man and uh, beast, chapter 9 and verses 8 through 12. And the, se the seventh plague was the hail in Exodus chapter 9 and verses 13 through 25. 
Then the eighth plague was the locust, chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. And the ninth plague was the darkness upon the land, and that's chapter 10 in verses 21 through 29. Now, the last plague, the 10th plague, was the Passover, and that was the death of the firstborn. And read about that in chapter 11, verses 1 through uh, uh, 10. But now, um, the, and this was a specific judgment of God upon the sin of Egypt and uh, Pharaoh. Now, uh, look in uh, chapter 11 and verses 5 and 6. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. See, so uh, uh, every home where the blood was not applied, uh, the Egyptian homes, the firstborn of the land shall die. And then the Bible says, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, even his own firstborn that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the uh, firstborn of the beast, the animal. So uh, from the richest to the poorest. And then in verse 6, And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any uh, more. So we read about the specific judgment there in uh, the Word of God. Now, as you turn over to chapter 12, and we read it uh, this evening, we see the details of the Passover. Now, number one in chapter 12 and in verse 3, he says, Speak ye unto all the congregation, say all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. Say according to the house for their fathers, a lamb for uh, a house. So, See, the lamb had to be taken. That's why, again, in the New Testament, Christ is our Passover. And then in verse 5 of chapter uh, 12, the Bible says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. See, no spot uh, in it, uh, no blemish in it in any way, no impurity of any kind. And the Bible says, without blemish, a male, see, uh, type of Christ, of the first year, and you shall take it out from the sheep and um, from uh, uh, the goats. So it was to be a male, and it was to be without a blemish. And then number three, in verse six, the Bible says, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So the lamb obviously had to be uh, a slain. And then uh, um, the result of that is that the blood of the lamb had to be applied. And we read about that in Exodus chapter 12 and verse th uh, 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token or a sign upon the houses where ye are, when I see the blood. See, and that's where we get that song in the hymn book, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now here in Exodus 12 and verse 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of uh, Egypt. So that was the uh, result of applying the blood. Now, as you look down in verse 7, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts of the door and on the upper doorpost or the lintel uh, of the houses wherein ye shall eat. Now, and they shall take of the blood and uh, uh, strike it upon the uh, two uh, doorposts and the lintel upon the top of the uh, uh, the door uh, there. And so the blood, the lamb had to be slain and the blood had to be applied in every house in the nation of uh, Israel at that particular time. And then in verse 12, we see here 
the sad result of not applying the blood. See, and um, in chapter 12 and verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite, see, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of e Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am uh, the Lord. Now, and so what we have here is the uh, description of the day of Passover. And uh, most of us don't have any question about that. I think we're uh, familiar with that, where uh, the uh, Jew had to take a lamb and he had to slay that lamb. Now, that's a, when you think about it, see, that's a very, very bloody thing. Now, uh, it was a, a bloody thing here. See, they had to take the lamb, slit the throat of uh, the lamb, and then they were to put the blood into a container, and then they were to apply the blood to the two, uh, two doorposts and the lintel of uh, the door. So it's very, very clear what was done. And what God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, what God said here is, see, if I do not see the blood, in other words, if you do not apply the blood, then the judgment of God will fall upon that home. And in that home, uh, the firstborn will be uh, smitten or uh, slain. So it's very obvious and clear what we read here in the Word of God about the Passover. We can read it, understand it, and uh, get the lesson. Now, what we uh, learn here, uh, and of course this is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that He's our Passover lamb, His blood was shed so that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be brought into a right relationship uh, uh, with God. But one of the, the basic things that we see here in the Word of God, and we don't want to miss out on it, is that, see, no one is ever saved by the wonderful life of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, no one is saved by the beautiful life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot of people that admire Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that preach about the Lord Jesus Christ and how wonderful uh, he was. But now, see, according to the Word of God, see, no one is saved by simply admiring his life. Now, a lot of people admire Jesus Christ. A lot of people have a good word to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, most all churches in America, talking about churches now, have a good word to say about Jesus Christ. Even those that are heretical and they don't believe in uh, being saved and being born again, say they have a good word to say about Jesus Christ. But now, see, what we see here, uh, no one would be saved from the judgment of God by simply thinking about it or admiring the lamb. Now, uh, suppose, uh, and you see, they had to keep the, the lamb for a certain period of time, and the lamb, you might say, almost during that period of time that we read about here, would almost become like a pet to them. Uh, uh, a beautiful little lamb, a harmless, innocent uh, uh, lamb, and I'm sure uh, the children in the home and uh, maybe others in the home would say, oh, that's such a beautiful lamb. So uh, we, we would never think of slaying the lamb. We wouldn't want to slay our little uh, 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 pet lamb. Now, uh, you see, the lamb had to be slain. See, if they admired the lamb and they said it's a beautiful lamb, it's a harmless lamb, uh, we want to keep this lamb as our pet. See, nobody was saved that way. See, the, the clear teaching in the Word of God is that they had to apply the blood to the door. They had to slay the lamb, you see, uh, in order to be saved from the judgment of God. Now, 
according to the Word of God, the Bible is very, very clear that the only way for anybody to be saved is on the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there is no other way to be saved apart from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last Wednesday night, we were dealing with the matter of purgatory. Now, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, teaches that, say, you go to the flames and the fire of purgatory if you are a good Roman Catholic, and in those flames, you see, you are purged from your sin. And they say that is the ultimate good work that you have to perform in order to have your sins forgiven. And they use the word very, very commonly and very, very clearly, that is the place where your sins are purged. That is where they are purified, very clear in relation to Roman Catholic uh, uh, doctrine. But now, see, the Bible teaches there's no work that you can do and there's no work that I can do to purge us of our sins or to cleanse us of our sins. Amen? See, the only way that we can be cleansed of our sin is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to be forgiven our, of our sins is on the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the clear teaching of the Bible. Now, with that in mind, I just want to list 12 things that the New Testament teaches about the blood of Jesus Christ. Because, of course, uh, the blood of the Lamb there is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, number one, I'm going to list these 12 things uh, uh, what, about what the New Testament teaches about the blood. 1 Peter 1 and verse 19, the blood of Jesus Christ is referred to as the precious blood of Christ that redeems us to God, that sets us free from the penalty of our sin. Number two, in Matthew chapter 27, in verse 4, the Bible talks there about innocent blood. And it was, in, a, in fact, uh, in the context there, that's talking about Ju uh, Judas. And remember, Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And it was innocent blood. The Lord Jesus Christ was the perfect, spotless uh, Lamb of God. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it's referred to there of the purchasing blood. We have been purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, number four, in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, the Bible refers to it as redeeming blood. We're redeemed on the basis of the blood. Uh, number five, in Romans 5 and verse 9, it's referred to as justifying blood. In other words, say, you and I are justified in the sight of God on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, number six, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, it's referred to there as the peace-assuring blood. What a tremendous uh, verse that is, as you read there in Colossians chapter 1 and uh, in verse 20. Say that it is the blood, and it's only on the basis of the blood that I can have peace with God, that you can have peace with God. And then uh, number 7, it's referred to in Hebrews 9 and verse 14 as, see, the purging, the purifying blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, Jesus there referred to his blood. He said, my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. And then uh, number nine, in Revelation 12 and verse 11, it's referred to there as 
victorious blood in Revelation 12 and verse 11. And then in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, we all know that verse, very, very familiar. It's referred to there as the cleansing blood. See, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And then number 11, in Romans 3 and verse 25, it's referred to there as the propitiating blood of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's again a, a big word, a, a Bible word, and a great Bible word. And what that simply means is that, you see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and he shed his blood, he satisfied the wrath of God upon sin. And God was satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. And that's why I can be forgiven of my sin, because he took the wrath that I deserve, you see, and he took it upon himself on the cross of Calvary. That's why in Romans 3.25, it's referred to as the propitiating blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in number 12, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, see, it's referred to there as the washing blood. The Bible says there uh, how he loved us and washed us from our sins. See, how are we washed from our sins? Revelation 1.5, who loved us and washed us from our sins. But here's what we're talking about. Revelation 1.5. He washed us from our sins in His own blood. What a great verse in the Bible. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. So it's washing blood. Uh, how He loved us, you see, and washed us from our sins, you see, in His own blood. What a great verse in the Bible, Revelation 1, 5. Say, we're all dirty in the sight of God. We are not clean in the sight of God. How can I be made clean in the sight of God? How can I have my sins washed away? Say, the cleansing, washing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is only upon the basis of that uh, blood. Now, as we think of the, sac uh, uh, the Passover, say, salvation is brought about by a bloody sacrifice. Now, a lot of times we, we don't emphasize that the way we should. We go back to the Passover. Say, the lamb had to be slain, slit in the throat in every home. Now, that blood had to be put into a container, and then it was applied to the door. And God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, our salvation today. Now, that's why I mentioned, say, number one, we are never saved by the wonderful, beautiful, even perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. As perfect as that was, as Wonderful and beautiful as it was, we're never saved by his life. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm, uh, uh, I think I'm going to heaven because I'm, I'm trying to uh, live according to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, that will not get someone to heaven. See, we are not saved by the life of Christ or by imitating him or walking in his steps or anything like that. That's not the way salvation, now we're talking about salvation, that's not the way salvation is brought about. The Bible is very, very clear, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, amen? Hebrews 9 and verse 22. See, without the shedding of blood, is no remission of sins. Now, a lot of times we read these verses in the Bible and we go over them and the thought is, well, 
you know, blood has to be, uh, uh, you know, it's through the blood. But see, without the shedding of blood, that blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, needed to be shed. See, and it needed to be applied. Now, see, um, we are saved through the bloody sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Now, as we mentioned many, many times, it was a very bloody scene. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ would have been covered with blood. The body would have been caked with blood. And that may be one of the reasons why in his resurrection body, he was so hard to recognize. Why? Because the last time they saw him, it was a body caked in blood. Just like maybe you see somebody that was in a terrible accident or somebody shot in war and they're filled with blood and, and uh, their body is uh, uh, caked in blood. And then sometime later, uh, you see that person, maybe they go in the hospital, they get uh, healed up and, they, uh, and uh, so forth. And then you look at them and you say, well, I, I, I don't even recognize you. I didn't realize you were that sick and, and, and now you look so good and hard to recognize. So, see, on three resurrection appearances, Christ was not recognized. They saw him, that's like we were preaching the other Sunday on that road to Emmaus. <laughs> they not only saw him, they were talking to him, amen? And they were conversing with him and I'm sure they looked him straight in the eye and they saw him, you see, and uh, yet they didn't recognize him. It could be because the last time they saw him, his body is caked in blood. He was unrecognizable upon the cross. Don't forget, he was not only crucified and cruelly treated, treated and beaten and so forth, but then remember somebody took that, that spear and they thrust it right in his side. So when you saw Jesus Christ on the cross, it was a bloody sacrifice. See, not only we talk about his blood, but it was a bloody uh, sacrifice. Now, the wonderful thing we see here very, very clearly in the Word of God is that, see, salvation comes about in a person's life. See, how is a person saved? Now, see, salvation is only by applying the blood of Jesus Christ to my life. See, there's no, uh, uh, that's the only way to be saved. See, in other words, I must apply his blood to my life. Now, here's another interesting thing. See, people can hear about the blood. People can know about the blood. Now, there are churches in America, and we thank God for any church that preaches the blood of Jesus Christ and salvation based upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God for any church that preaches that. Amen. We thank God for anyone that would preach the message of the blood. But does that mean that everybody in those churches and everybody who hears about the blood of Christ as taught in the Word of God does that mean that everybody that hears it is saved? And the answer is absolutely no. Why? See, I must apply the blood to my life. You see, that is my responsibility, to apply that blood. Say, Jesus, you died for me. I want you as my Savior. Now, now how do we apply that blood to our lives? Now, see, the Bible says it's by repentance and faith. Repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is how you and I apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our uh, lives. Say, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, there are a lot of people say, oh, I believe in the blood of Christ. I heard about the blood of Christ and, and uh, I heard about Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary. But uh, if you ask them, are you a sinner? 
Do you believe that in the sight of God, you are a sinner? And a lot of people say, oh, no. So I'm not a, a sinner. Now, you know, maybe I, uh, I told some white lies, but, you know, I never murdered anybody. And, and uh, uh, you know, see, but the Bible is very clear. See, that word sinners is used over and over and over again in the Bible. See, Christ Jesus came not to call the righteous, but remember what Jesus said, but sinners unto repentance. It's a Bible word. See, and in order to apply his blood to my life, I must realize I am a sinner. Now, someone might say, well, I accept Christ, you know. Uh, well, the thing about it, See, no one can truly accept him unless they realize they are a sinner. And then, of course, Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So now, you see, it's very clear. See, I must apply that blood to my life. See, I not only need to realize that Christ died for me, but see, I have the responsibility to invite him in, to make a decision, to believe in him, to trust in him, no matter uh, how we might want to put it. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. See, and all of that uh, reminds us of the fact, and all those wonderful verses in the Word of God remind us of the fact that, you see, I personally must apply the blood to the door. Say, the blood has to be applied to the door. Now, if the blood is not applied... Now, now a Jew could say, you know, I know about the blood. I know what God says. But um, I don't want to be involved in slaying a lamb. That's too bloody for me. That's, uh, that's something that I don't like. Uh, to do. Now, see, if a Jew said that, the judgment of God would fall upon him. See, because the, the death angel uh, only passes over, you see, the, the house where the blood has been applied. Now, suppose someone said, well, uh, I, I know I should do it, but, um, you know, I'm just going to put it off. And uh, just like in relation to salvation today. Now, you, you think, Back in the nation of Israel now, here in Egypt, could anybody have been so foolish to say, Lord, I know what you said. I know you want me to apply, uh, apply the blood <clears throat> to my life uh, or my home, my door. I know that. But... Uh, I just don't feel like doing it. Not today. I'll not do it tonight. Now, maybe next week I'll do it. See, and if they didn't do it that night, you see, the judgment of God would fall upon the, ho uh, the home. And uh, you think no one could be that foolish to do something like that. Well, look at how foolish many people are today when it comes to salvation, how they put it off. How they say, well, a more convenient time or I don't feel like doing it. I, I don't want to be involved in that uh, bloody slaying of the lamb. And then the judgment of God would fall upon uh, that, uh, that home. Well, uh, I trust we'll realize a simple lesson here in the Word of God. And that simple lesson is make sure that we have uh, applied the blood to our door. Amen? Say, make sure that I have applied the blood of Jesus Christ to my life. You see, that's the message of uh, the Passover. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, uh, even tonight, if someone has not done that, you say, well, I know about the Lamb. I know what the Bible teaches. I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners. That's good to know about it. See, the Jew could know all about 
what God said about the land. But you see, the blessing and uh, the Passover land, uh, Passover uh, angel will not pass over, you see, unless the blood is applied. You see, uh, so just knowing about it is good. And uh, we have to be saved. Uh, that's a part of being saved. We have to know that Jesus died for us. But there's all the difference in the world in knowing about it and applying it to my life in a personal way and making that decision where I say, Jesus, I need you. Lord Jesus Christ, um, I want to apply your blood to my life. I want to accept you as my personal Savior. So the question is, have I, have you, have we truly applied the blood to our lives. Another interesting thing is when the Jew did that at the Passover. See, where he'd do what God said, he took the lamb, he'd slay the lamb, and he would apply the blood. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Didn't see the blood, the judgment of God would fall uh, upon that particular uh, uh, home. Now, uh, very clear, you see, as we read and study the Word of God. You see, now, um, here's someone that knows all about it. See, that doesn't save them from the judgment of God. See, they have to personally apply that blood to their lives. They can think about it. They can know about it. They can know they should do it, but there's all the difference in the world in actually doing it, you see, and applying that blood uh, to their uh, life. As we think of, Judas was numbered with the apostles. Judas was never saved. He never applied the blood of Christ to his life. He never personally trusted Jesus Christ as his personal uh, a savior. So, and the thing about it is that that Jew now in the Old Testament, that Passover, now when he would take the lamb and slay the lamb and apply the blood to his home, would he know whether he applied the blood or not? See, he took that bu bucket and took that hyssop and applied it. Say, he knew he was safe that night. Why? Because he knew that he applied the blood. He did what God uh, said for him to do. That's why uh, he would know about it. Now, see, if someone is saved, they should know they're saved. Now, do you think that the Jew, the head of that home, would ever forget that night? Do you think that, that that's something that, oh, well, you know, just don't, I don't, you know, they'd never forget it, amen? Why? Because all the firstborn, cattle and uh, human beings in the nation of Egypt were slain that night because the blood was not applied to their homes. See, the Jew would never forget that. He'd never forget uh, the, the, the day, that night that he took the blood and applied it to his door. And that's why we should know whether we're saved or not. Amen? See, we should know uh, that day, that time, that experience we had when we applied the blood of Jesus Christ to our lives. And if we have, we should, we, we, uh, we'll never forget it. See, how could they forget that night, that was the night of all nights there uh, in uh, uh, Egypt. Well, if someone has not applied the blood of Christ to their life, certainly this is a time to do it. And you can do it right now. You can do it tonight. You can do that right where you are 
is say, Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. I certainly want to turn from my sin, and I want to trust Thee as my personal Savior. If you haven't done it, you need to do it tonight.